It's a great, great pleasure to introduce Keith Quaylo, the Thousand Martin Professor of History and Public Affairs and the Vice Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School. Keith Quaylo, as uh, many of you know, uh, his research examines a wide array of issues in public health, scientific and technological innovation in medical care, medical specialization, and the role of identity, gender, race, and ethnicity in health and disease thought. He is the, the author of numerous award-winning books including The Troubled Dream of Genetic Medicine, Dying in the City of Blues, like just an amazing, a classic in the history uh, uh, of medicine uh, books, and Drawing Blood. He, he published recently, and he's a, he loves books. He loves to write books, right? <laughs> <laughs> and read them, too. And read them, too. Well, how can one write without read, right? OK, so no, but he's a wonderful writer of books, and he has been very um, a productive, even though he's invested in all kinds of administrative responsibilities as of late. Um, he published recently How Cancer Crossed the Color Line, and most recently, Pain, A, Pause, Political History. And um, beautifully and powerfully uh, uh, titled. He's also, he loves to collaborate with uh, interdisciplinary groups of scholars. He has published several, several edited um, volumes. And it's a great, great pleasure to have such an incredible and passionate thinker who produces works of such incredible social and political significance with us today. Please welcome Keith Whalo. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Joao, for the wonderful introduction and also for the invitation to uh, speak here. And uh, you know, when I looked at the invitation, it was really two different invitations uh, collapsing a talk uh, for two kinds of audiences. One, an audience that's interested in global health, um, seen through different sorts of disciplinary lenses, and the other, your conference on visions of care uh, with your visitors uh, in this collaborative endeavor. And so what I tried to do is to kind of reflect on this book that was just produced, which I have to apologize is, is rigorously American, US focused, but also has a global dimension. Uh, and to some extent, what I'm interested in uh, is looking at the politics of care, uh, the visions of care in the US context around the problem of pain. Uh, which I think, and I, I'll do it in such a way as to kind of problematize the question of uh, how do we debate pain and how do we debate care in the U.S. Uh, and maybe open it up for you to think about how it resonates with and connects with these problems in, in global health. Um, so in the U.S. context, uh, for the last 70 years and more, pain medicine, the question of who's in pain, what degree of relief they deserve, uh, has been the source of ongoing controversy. It's captured somewhat humorously here in this New Yorker cartoon from 2000. The doctor stands over the bedside and says, we can give you enough medication to alleviate the pain, but not enough to make it fun. <laughs> and in an atmosphere where um, there's a strong and ardent consumer ethic in healthcare, uh, the question of where relief ends and the production of pleasure uh, with opioids and other medications uh, is a constant worry, shadowing how physicians make decisions at the bedside. But pain is more complicated than that. Uh, pain raises a question that really came up at the end of your last panel, the question of measurement. Um, what is reliable measurement for pain? Pain is necessarily subjective. It is a case in which the expert depends on individual patients and to some extent secondary indices, uh, blood pressure, respiration, as an index of pain, but you, wear, you never really know how much pain someone is in. Despite the fact that the American Pain Society would like to say, call pain the fifth vital sign, it is not a vital sign in the sense that temperature and blood pressure are. It's not necessarily, or there's not a real sophisticated understanding of how pain is necessarily related to pathology. So it raises all kinds of puzzles about measurement. What is it and how much you should trust this subjective judgment? Of course, in the realm of uh, using medications, pharmaceutical agents for relief, it raises another problem of addiction, dependence, 
particularly when opioids are being uh, used in these clinical encounters, and the shadow of addiction always looms for that physician at the bedside. In terms of visions of care, context, the context in which the person experiences pain makes a huge difference in the meaning. This is particularly important in the debate in the US context starting in the 19, well, 80s and 90s, but it actually predates this, around how to appropriately use morphine at the end of life. After all, for people suffering from terminal cancer and other ailments, morphine suppresses blood pressure, it inhibits respiration, it unquestionably provides relief for people who are ailing at the end of life, but it also hastens death. So where is the line between compassionate care and euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide? This is a blurry line, right, that moves from compassion and a vision, a vision of care into the realm of questions of murder uh, in some instances. And then there's this underlying question of how should we be when we are in pain? Is it OK to complain? If so, how much? too excessive, you run the risk of being labeled a hysteric, or really indulging yourself uh, at the expense of others, too little, and you're accused of holding too much of your pain in, not sharing enough, not giving the physician or the healthcare workers enough guidance as to what ails you. So this question of you know, cultural values about how to bear pain and how to express pain underpins and then there's this, as I said, this question that I got interested in as I wrote the history of pain politics in US society for the last seven years is who should judge these issues? Is it just the physician alone? Or is it others? <coughs> so what I want to do today is to sort of take you very quickly through the last 70 years of debates around these questions. Who's in pain? How do we know? What degree of relief they deserve? and how these issues at the bedside over the course of the last 70 years kind of migrate in and out of political controversies, how these theories of pain and practices of measurement and relief migrate beyond the boundaries of the clinic, and ultimately, and this was the surprise to me as a historian writing about and trying to understand the politics of clinical care, how these issues migrated into politics. I don't mean politics at the bedside, I mean macro politics and also how the question of law became crucial to the study and the kind of management of these debates. Uh, uh, my training is in a field called the history and sociology of science. And in some ways, this is a kind of a, a case study tailor-made for a scholar like me that's interested in the sociology of knowledge more generally. Now, when I say the politics, when I have the term pol a political history, I mean politics in two different ways. There's a micropolitics of pain. And that is uh, what I was trained to study was how do disciplines and specialties theorize a problem in relationship to one another? How do molecular biologists think about a problem? How do hematologists think about a problem? Pathologists, and in the case that I'm going to be talking about today, anesthesiologists, psychiatrists, pharmacologists, surgeons, and psychologists all having their own theories of yeah. how to measure pain and what pain is, how do they interact with each other, and how do issues of objective measurement and subjective complaint play out in the doctor-patient relationship in scientific theories. I'm drawing on this micropolitics on a book that's written in 1977 by sociologist Anselm Strauss, who also talked about the politics of pain management. And he said, by which he means not political parties, which I'll get to in a second, but Actions at the bedside like persuading, appealing to authority, negotiating, even threatening the patient in order to get things done. And this is the kind of micropolitics that interested me in my, fur in my previous book, Dying in the City of the Blues, where by the 1990s you'd have African American patients with sickle cell disease saying that you know, they had a hard time getting appropriate pain relief in urban settings because before you can get past the agony, you have to convince a doctor that it's real. So there's a micropolitics of relief that's in this book. But then there's also a macropolitics of pain. And to give you a quick sense of what that macropolitics are, you might say that this is an era in the US society where aging uh, and the rise of chronic illness makes pain much more significant as a public health challenge. 
We have an economy of largely sedentary workers. I'll try not to talk too long um, in order to encourage you to get out and get some exercise. But this is kind of conducive to. After 6 p.m. Right? <laughs> You're going to be here all day, right? Case in point. And there are new questions that emerge around how to properly care for people that are byproducts of this new economy. And a new question, a political question, at the macro stage emerges, which is, is chronic pain a disability? And how are we to know? And if so, what degree of relief, and by relief I mean not just relief in the sense that clinicians mean relief, but relief in the legal sense, as well as in the social sense. What degree of relief should be granted? And rising concerns about the cost of such relief, the financial costs, as well as clinical frustrations. I mean, chronic pain is particularly frustrating to clinicians because people keep coming back, right? If you have an acute care model that says, you know, we have an illness, we have a cure, people go away and they feel better, chronicity is necessarily perplexing and vexing and highly frustrating. It's also the, the physicians also become gatekeepers to things like disability benefits in this era. And as well as the question of addiction and dependence, you can see already why pain is a fraught area uh, for clinical care as well at the micro as well as the macro political level. So um, I think a crucial problem, a conceptual issue for understanding pain is this. That, uh, one of the conceptual challenges is, is pain a sign like pulse, blood pressure, respiration temperature? Is it necessarily related to pathology or is it a symptom? Is it, is it subjective and therefore undependable? This is one of the questions that really confounded clinicians uh, after World War II. Are complaints evidence of perhaps something underlying, like a maladjustment or malingering? So pain, throughout the history I'm going to tell, raised the question of what I call intersubjective understanding and judgment. Another cartoon, no, they're not like us. They don't feel pain. How are we to know? <laughs> Well, one of the characters I follow in my book is a, um, what, who later became known as the founding father of American pain medicine, a guy named John Bonica, uh, who in 1974, he's asked in the US News and World Report, Dr. Bonica, what is pain? Can science actually define the sensation? And he says, if you ask 100 different authorities that question, you would get 100 different answers. Um, pain, throughout its history, raises this question of how you weigh objective and subjective evidence in the clinic, in the science, but also, as I said, official, uh, uh, ultimately in law and in politics. And I think the thing I'm going to try to illuminate today is my surprise at finding the role, seeing the role of uh, judges in deciding these questions of who's in pain, how pain should be judged, and what degree of relief people deserve, not scientists and not clinicians. What I want to do very quickly is to talk about the complexity of pain care after World War II, an era that begins the rise of chronic pain as a significant problem, but clinicians themselves aren't quite sure what to do with it. We have soldiers returning from the war, uh, where the question of disability and whether pain qualifies as disability is perplexing. And it's a time period in which there are three dominant disciplinary or specialty frameworks for thinking about what pain is and how people should be relieved. There's the surgical, the pharmacological, and the psychiatric. I want to take you through the 1960s, an era that sees, you might say, the liberalization in pain theory and pain care, symbolized by a new theory called the gate control theory, but also ultimately by the 1970s, the embrace of a wide range of new ways of relieving patients, patient control of analgesia, acupuncture. It really is a liberal theory and a set of liberal developments for a liberal time in American culture and society. And I want to show you how that's reflected in changing disability laws in the 1960s and 70s, and how this all runs up against the conservative trend, the conservative turn in American politics, and how that manifests itself in the clinic. Right? So there is a macro political story and a micro political story I'd like to tell that hinges around questions of whether subjectivity should matter, and if so, how. And I want to end very quickly by talking about the history of the debate about whose pain should matter, uh, and the politics of relief and the right to relief, the themes of the Vision of Care conference. A little word about the doctor, John Bonica. He, uh, he emigrated to the US from Italy in 1928. He got his MD in 1942. Uh, he began an interest in pain medicine because of World War II service. 
out on the West Coast at uh, Fort Lewis in Washington. That's where he became interested in taking care of soldiers returning from the war. He was chief of anesthesiology, where he cared for hundreds of those soldiers dealing with intractable pain. He became interested in the use of analgesic nerve blocks uh, and the way in which that could inhibit uh, pain sensation. And after the war, he started a practice in Tacoma, Washington, in a community hospital, where he inaugurated the first what's called a multidisciplinary pain clinic, where you needed a neurosurgeon, psychiatrist, and other medical colleagues thinking about what this problem of pain was. In 53, this is where he made his name. He published a book called The Management of Pain, which became regarded by uh, 20 years later as the textbook, as the Bible of the pain field. He became chair of anesthesiology at the University of Washington, where he continued to organize the multidisciplinary model. He was the founder of a new international pain society, a new journal by the 1970s. This is when he was anointed as the father of pain medicine. His papers are out at UCLA, and so I was able to kind of track his career. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a kind of life as part. I'm interested in the doctor's life. And by the 1980s and 1990s, you know, the model of pain care that he inaugurates is seen as a national model, and indeed an international model. He is an advisor to ministries of health and education in eight foreign countries on the development of pain therapy and research. There's part of the global reach of this American story. Now, when he entered the field, what did it look like in the 1940s and 1950s? As I said, there were three sort of dominant frameworks for thinking about pain. And one of them was the psychiatric framework. And insofar as you've spent a little time in the conference talking about kind of the disregard of the subjective, you might say psychiatry was puzzled by whether pain was important enough to take seriously, and if so, how seriously. Uh, a Boston psychiatrist writing in 1959 wrote, the relief of pain is obviously one of the main functions of physicians. Ironically, it's one of the things we do least well, partly because we don't understand it. And one of the things that psychiatrists didn't understand is, you know, they weren't quite sure what to make about the pain, what to say about the pain complainant. If on the East Coast, uh, one psychiatrist was worried about this, on the West Coast, Henry Albronda, another psychiatrist, was far less sympathetic to the pain complainant. At a California pain symposium in 1957, Albronda says, the patient in chronic pain is certainly worthy of study, but not necessarily worthy of sympathy. <laughs> he says, chronic complaints may develop in the child brought up to repress, repress feelings of hatred, who then may use those complaints of pain to cover his hostile feelings towards an associate. For him, malingering and maladjustment underlie the chronic painful complaint. And this is a kind of a psychodynamic theory within psychiatry that suggests that a complaint, a symptom, is not necessarily to be taken at face value. These anxieties, I should say, are not, um, have not been absent in medicine. Malingering and deception, in this case in adolescence, is still a continuing worry. I have an adolescent myself. I'm not sure my concerns rise to the level uh, as reflected in this uh, uh, textbook. The playing sick, right, and the way in which the sick role gives people an out um, is certainly an ongoing concern in some areas of medicine. Another area that you might be surprised playing, played a dominant role when Bonica came back from the war is surgery. Neurosurgery is seen as, leading, as a leading edge of pain medicine, particularly playing uh, a significant role in the management of severe and persistent pain at the end of life, in cancer pain, for instance. So the severing of, uh, of, of uh, the severing of, of the uh, neurological system, the um, uh, surgical intervention, neurosurgery, um, playing a particular role, and surprisingly also lobotomy mm -hmm. in the role of uh, end of life pain care. And from practice, theorizing what pain looks like. So I apologize for the image, but I just want to give you a kind of a concrete sense of what surgeons offer. Uh, writing in the uh, Annals of the New York Academy of Science in 1960, one author wrote, you know, for the care of the chronic patient, certain aspects of the personality or perceptual style which are changed by a prefrontal lobotomy carried out for the relief of pain are precisely those that differentiate within the normal population those who can tolerate pain well from those who suffer greatly from it. I'm not sure this is much relief for those of you who have a high pain threshold, that there's a, actually something about your lobotomy that explains, the, the, your frontal cortex that explains that. Or put another way, a person who is exceptionally tolerant of pain has the personality and perceptual style of the individual after a prefrontal lobotomy. 
Whereas one who cannot tolerate pain resembles in personality a patient before prefrontal lobotomy. I mean, this is a kind of a rigorously surgical-centric understanding of what pain is. Uh, surgeons are also using chordotomies, the severing of uh, the spinal cord nerve, which is regarded as really crucial. Here's a 1940s discussion in the New York Times in which surgeons talk about the difficulty of these two procedures. The difficulty of the chordotomy is to cut the pain tract so completely that the pain is permanently relieved, but so selectively that there's no injury to the bladder control or in, in, ensuing weakness of the legs. And then you, you see the kind of the weighing of alternatives of care here. Compared to lobotomy, he says, chordotomy is the more difficult operation for the surgeon, but the easiest for the patient and his family. And here's the kicker. Lobotomies eliminate anxiety and suffering, and the patient no longer asks for morphine, uh, which gives you a sense of the politics of care at this time. And as I said, one of the ironies here is that the way lobotomies were conceptualized is that it was conceptualized as a kind of a hardening of the outer shell. In other words, people still said that they were in pain. You asked them if they were in pain and whether the pain had changed, they said no. But they don't worry about it, they didn't have anxiety about it, and they didn't complain. And more importantly, in an atmosphere of con with concern for addiction, they didn't ask for the morphine. Right? So this kind of illuminates some of the micropolitics of care after World War II. The third area that John Bonica embraced was, uh, to use Joao Beale's concept, the pharma pharmaceuticalization of pain. A theory that really uh, of pain as being impeded by analgesic nerve blocks and other kinds of pharmaceutical innovations, Percodan, uh, oxycodone, uh, being one of the leading new agents emerging in the post-war pharmaceutical boom times. Now, there's a history of pain medicine as a pharma through the pharmaceutical lens that embraces innovation and novelty uh, only to be disappointed by the problems created by the embrace of the pharmaceutical. And oxycodone is a case in point in the 1950s. So first embraced as acting fast, lasting long, providing thorough relief, as good as morphine, but of course doesn't produce the addictive uh, qualities, so they said, and does not produce respiration depression. And the argument for why it was not addictive was that it was broken down very slowly. And the model of addiction was the more quickly a drug is metabolized, the more likely it is to produce euphoria. <laughs> And because a drug is broken down slowly, it's likely not to produce that euphoric effect, therefore the dependence and the addiction. Ironically, you know, oxycodone came back again in the 1990s as oxycontin. And the idea for oxycontin was that it was going to be time release. So what they didn't anticipate is that if you chew it, it's no longer time release. Or, so, so, but it's the same product, oxycodone back in a new form. Um, this is also the time period, and this is what John Bonica really devotes himself to. Now, why did these different pain theories matter in the context of the 1940s and 1950s and into the 1960s? Well, there was a private sector concern. The rise of the drug industry provokes on the West Coast for California Attorney General Stanley Mosk a concern about whether this is affecting clinical practice and leading to new kinds of problems of, you might say, unintended effects of pain care. As, as Mosk is concerned in 1961 about the high-powered campaign waged by the Endo Company, the producer of Percodan, among doctors and pharmacists, and he also bemoans the drug company's apparent influence on the California Medical Association, which had weighed in on whether Percodan needed strict controls, triplicate controls, or could be kind of prescribed individually without broader monitoring. You can see the kind of the politics of care entering the political arena in the early 1960s, particularly around drugs, when you have Edward Bloomquist, who works with the California Medical Association, saying, you know, maybe there is a pro that, that we need to have a th how the theories of addiction should shape our ideas about the control of this particular agent of relief. He writes the following that gives you a sense of the kind of politics of care as they're entering the legislative arena. He says, the drug has acquired the unenviable status of being the principal choice as a substitute for heroin by California-based heroin addicts. The irony here is today we talk about OxyContin leading to heroin use. Then the concern was whether heroin users were turning to Percodan. 
He also has the theory of unstable personalities, a situational one. He says, it may seem odd that California has become the center of Burkittan use. Two factors may contribute to this. California has an undue share of unstable personalities <laughs> who welcome bizarre methods of escaping reality. <laughs> well, he was right, actually, because the times were changing in California. California, particularly Northern California, did have uh, a larger and larger number of people who were looking for a means of escape. Uh, not just drugs, but also lifestyle was part of that. Uh, but it's also this context that leads him to, as well as U.S. Senators, to look closely at Perkadan in terms of the politics of relief. So I just want to give you a sense of the fraught environment in which John Bonica enters. And the role of the gatekeeper, the role of the anesthesiologist, was somehow to navigate these complexities. When was a drug safe enough to warrant what kind of regulation? Uh, and he worked very closely with the pharmaceutical industry, always aware of the broader political economy of care. Well, this began to change in the 1960s with the arrival of an alternative theory of relief. Uh, we know it today as the gate control theory. And interestingly enough, it's a product, it's a child of the 60s in the sense that it is a theory that bring, comes to medicine from outside with a very reformist impulse. It's, Authors are a Canadian psychologist named Ronald Melzack and a British physiologist named Patrick Wall. And they come up with a theory of pain that increasingly has traction politically and socially and clinically in the 1960s. And part of their argument is that surgical theory is just wrong. The concept of a pain center of the brain is totally inadequate, they argue in their path-breaking article and then subsequent book to account for the sequence of behavior and experience. Indeed, the concept is pure fiction. The thalamus, the limbic system, the hypothalamus, the parietal cortex, the frontal cortex are all implicated in pain perception, they argue. And they also argue that pharmacological theory is too narrow, that pain is more than just stimulus, nerve, spinal cord, and brain. Pain is individual psychology, neurophysiology. It's past history. You've had those experiences in the past, and you see them coming at you again. You'll react differently than if you didn't have that experience. It's the context, end of life pain, different from childbirth pain. Uh, and it's also personality. And they move the conversation to questions of perception. Very difficult to study, but they say this is really the key question we should be tackling. Ron Melzack becomes a, something of a kind of a theory entrepreneur. He's a critic of the dominance of surgery, psychiatry, and pharmacy in pain medicine. And he says, you know, the reason why we emphasize these is really a historical accident. These happen to be the fields that are growing and dominant after World War II. Radical surgery, the rise of the pharmaceutical industry, and the role of psychiatry after World War II. He says, if we can recover from a historical accident, other methods deserve more attention than they receive. And looking back from the 70s, he saw gate control theory being the writing in on a zeitgeist, opening up and liberalizing pain medicine and our theories of pain. In some ways, the, it was influenced by cybernetics theory, ideas about amplification, the use. It's, it comes out of like triode, you know, triode vacuum tubes. And the idea is that, a no, that gates, electrical type gates, long fibers and short fibers, influ, uh, open and close, transmitting pain impulses. But the, the things that open and close the gates could be many, not just drugs, and not just the severing of the, the, the spinal cord, um, but also hypnosis, uh, suggestion, relaxants, uh, and just sort of general talk therapy. So you can see how this theory opens and creates new possibilities, new alternative methods should be explored. Now, once again, why do these theories matter? Well, it turns out that these debates, Henry Albranda's concern that pain was really a byproduct of maladjustment, or these theories about whether pain perception was real or not, mattered because in 1956, the US government and also the California government had established new disability uh, benefits. Within Social Security, uh, President Eisenhower had signed legislation uh, creating the right of 
disability benefits within the Social Security system. He'd done so reluctantly, pressured by Democrats. In some ways, this was a kind of a backstop against the idea of nationalized medicine or national health care. And one of the new questions that emerges once you create that disability benefit is, what evidence establishes the right to make a claim compensable disability? And where does pain fit? After all, disability is, you know, you've lost a leg, you've lost an arm, a soldier comes back from the front, they've lost a half of their jaw, they can't walk. Pain? Chronic pain? Does this fit? As cases come before the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, it's the secretary who often judges. There's an appeals process if you're rejected. And if you're rejected yet again, you seek relief in the federal courts. So what you're able to do as a historian is to track the debate about relief and the role of pain as a compensable disability in the courts. And what do you find? Well, in 1959, a Texas housewife named Rosie Page brings her case before Secretary Celebrezzi in the, um, well, actually, he's, he's in the uh, Kennedy administration. Uh, by the time she, her case is, now, now she's a classic example of a woman in pain. She has arthritis, but the question is how much arthritis makes you disabled. With what her physicians call a marked psychogenic overlay of her symptoms, she applies for benefits and she is rejected. And it's her case that becomes a landmark in 1963, uh, where the judge, John Brown, who is a Republican uh, um, Eisenhower appointee, He's known as one of the Fifth Circuit Four. He becomes a really crucial judge in writing new civil rights legislation. Um, but he also is a Republican. And so he thinks that you know you should be, we have a society where people should think of themselves as their brother's keepers. But not everybody had a right to be kept. And this is what he said. So he thought of laws as kind of being built around those principles. And in the landmark case of the Brown v. Celebrezzi, it's his decision that makes pain and subjective pain into a compensable disability. He writes, if pain is real to the patient, the disability entitles the person to the statutory benefits. The fact that the pain complained of by the claimant is not shown by objective clinical and laboratory findings does not mean that HEW must give little weight to allegations thereof. And really, the door to subjective pain being real pain is opened in a legal sense at that moment. There are other indices that show the rise and rising importance of subjective pain as real pain in the 1960s into the early 1970s. Another touchstone might be the book People in Pain, written by an anthropologist named Mark Zabrowski. Looking back in retrospect, this is either the rise of cultural sensitivity, the awareness that culture matters in pain expression, or the crudest form of ethnic stereotyping. It's both. <laughs> It shows the role of culture. He says, you know, he does a study in the VA, and he says, you know, Jews, they complain a lot. <laughs> they're very suspicious of doctors, and they're always concerned about pain. Italians are also very complainy, uh, vocal, but they trust physicians. And they're also very present-oriented. If the pain is now, they'll complain, but if the pain is past, they'll stop complaining. He says the Irish are kind of pathologically stoic. <laughs> they ignore pain to their detriment, and they're also highly suspicious of medical authority. And old Americans, it won't surprise you, Anglo-Americans are seen as the ideal patients. <laughs> they know how to talk about pain, they know how to rationalize pain, and they speak the language of clinicians. Like I said, it's a very fascinating book that, that's, that really is a product of its moment, realizing that culture matters, that expression matters, but doing it in a way that's sort of like raw stereotypes of social groups. At the same time, you have new indices of the rise of cultural pain, uh, pain is real, subjective pain is real pain, the rise of the multidisciplinary pain clinic, the thing that Bonica had created in the West Coast is now becoming more and more prominent. It's written about by a wonderful sociologist named Isabel Basinger, um, inventing pain medicine from laboratory to clinic. There are other indices, and a shift, you might say, on the technologies of care. New pain journals emerge. And even the pushback in the 1970s, you know, we've passed in 1970 a new Controlled Substances Act that says LSD, marijuana, um, heroin, they have no place in medicine. But then there's an activist pushback that says, why? Why not enfold these into new technologies of care? 
uh, activists pushing government to rethink their concerns about these substances. We're back again with marijuana, right? Medical marijuana came back again, uh, LSD and heroin still on the periphery. Um, and then there's these fascinating shifts that really signal a shift in the doctor-patient relationship, the rise of patient-controlled analgesia. Instead of debating how much pain somebody's in, just put the morphine drip in their hands under controlled circumstances and let the, them determine how much relief they need. Patients can be trusted to control the circumstances of their own care. Or Melzack comes up with the McGill pain questionnaire, which is omnipresent today, or variations on it, like on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever experienced. How would you rate your pain right now? Ask the patient, and they will tell you and they will guide you, right? In this case, you know, is your pain spreading, annoying, is it terrifying? It's really in this context that John Bonica sees his clinic grow, and it's also in this context that he looks back and he says, you know, the thing that really ushered in the rebirth of the field is the spinal gate theory. The field of pain research, which had stagnated for almost a century, has recently been reborn, and he attributed that transformation to the arrival of gate control theory. It endorsed, you might say, the liberalization of pain, right? So it's as far as I think about the 60s and the early 70s as a liberal era, it's partly the critique of you know, conventional medical authority, but it's also the embrace of relaxants, tranquilizers, sedatives, placebos. These are the things that uh, Melzack suggested all deserve more attention than they uh, had gotten. Now, there were critics of this theory, and I want to just highlight one of them, because there are some ironies about the rise of gate control theory. One of them is another British researcher, a neurologist named P. W. Peter Nathan, who said, look, this theory wrote in based on very little evidence. The work underlying the theory was an electrophysiological investigation in cats. It was not based on investigation of pain, but on electrical stimulation and recording. And then clinical neurologists, sort of, you know, in, in, in the full embrace of these times, uh, followed the advances, read the papers in small animals, and tended to transpose what they learned to clinical neurology in man. So he says, look, as a scientist, I don't think there's anything to this theory, right? But he says, although the theory, it has, it has been successful, that doesn't mean that it's right. In other words, it's produced a lot of new developments in pain theory and pushed us to think more broadly about care. But then he says, you know, ideas ultimately need to be fruitful. They don't have to be right. <laughs> and curiously enough, he says, the two, a productive theory and the correctness of a theory, don't necessarily have to go together. And the interesting thing about Peter Nathan is that he, he walked the walk as well as talked the talk. So after saying this, he turned to his friend and colleague, Patrick Wall, and he said, let us think about something like electrical stimulation as a way of impeding state pain impulses. And they embraced and began to develop something called transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, which are everywhere. As in, you wear these belts, and they send the uh, you know, impulses, and they impede pain. They're very useful. Probably somebody's wearing one in the audience right now. But this is a good example of pain theories being productive, even if you don't believe that they're true. Now, it's also in the context of the 1970s that uh, another global set of developments reshapes pain care for people like John Bonica. When President Nixon goes to China, um, there's a famous case of James Reston, a journalist who is afflicted with appendicitis. He's treated with conventional Western-type medicines, but he's also treated with acupuncture, and it feeds a fascination with acupuncture. So Nixon goes to China, acupuncture comes to America. <laughs> and the question is, what is a pain specialist to do with this innovative idea, which also pushes the boundaries, seems to be legitimated by gate control theory, uh, a theory uh, which explains and somehow legitimates acupuncture, uh, which physicians had uh, dismissed. And here, a more humorous image than the lobotomy image, but it gives you a sense. Uh, here is the LA Times in which they say the gate control theory says that the nerve signals from the body can be gated or blocked in the spinal cord while they're on their way to the brain. It's believed that the stimulation produced by acupuncture needle causes the gates to be closed, like a literal reading of the gate control theory here, which is very happy. Uh, researchers agree on one point that it works, but they don't know quite why. This Chinese medicine challenges the pain field. 
Uh, one physician in Miami, he's Bonica's buffeted with letters. One physician writes, I'm literally being flooded with requests for referrals of patients to acupuncture centers. I know of very few physicians who are currently involved in acupuncture. Do you have any information that I can use? Qualified physicians to <coughs> who I can refer patients? And of course, John Bonica says, no, I don't. He's buffeted by requests for his expertise. Legislatures are wondering, you know, how do we license these things? How do we regulate these acupuncture centers that are bob bobbing up? And also the NIH is asking this question of how do we weigh efficacy? How do we judge efficacy in this case? It's not the kind of thing that you can subject to a conventional clinical trial the way you can with drugs, which is the field that Bonica is comfortable with. Um, subjective testimony, should that be the de determinant of whether this is a sound way forward? Uh, and what is the role of ideology in all of this? As in, we're just embracing this because it's the latest thing coming from China, which is opening its doors. It's an atmosphere of detente. You know, how can we look past these kinds of infatuations, perhaps? So the pain uh, needle killer, the, the needle painkiller comes to America. One of the things, if you're John Bonica, what do you do? Well, you head to China, <laughs> which is uh, him here on the Great Wall with his camera. And one of the things he does is he attends operations uh, in which acupuncture is being used as the primary means of medicine. He's documenting the procedure. He observes patients. He interviews practitioners. He does field recordings. He becomes something of an anthropologist, a field researcher, <laughs> trying to understand the politics of pain care in this new locale and bring the knowledge back home. And it's interesting what he observes, because whereas I was interested in writing about the politics of pain care in the US, by following Bonica, what I realized is that he was an astute observer of the politics of pain care in China. In his field book, he writes, the patient undergoing the lobectomy commented that he was pleased to have the opportunity to participate in this kind of anesthesia, which was only due to the progress promoted by Chairman Mao. <laughs> or, during the Cultural Revolution, this a negative trend of disusing acupuncture was considered the work of revisionists and subsequently greater emphasis was given to the development and widespread use. I gained a definite impression that many anesthesiologists are not so impressed by acupuncture but still extol its virtues and exaggerate the number of cases done because this is in compliance with Chairman Mao's teachings and admonitions. This is of course at the tail end of the Cultural Revolution that he's going there and he's seeing in full view the way in which politics plays itself out all the way down to the level of clinical care. And that's actually what I'm interested in doing as well. So it was fascinating. So it's really in this context when he comes home and he's asked, is there a science of pain? And he says, if you ask 100 different experts, you will get 100 different answers. The context is a, a, a change of uh, subjectivity, the rise of subjective pain, of micropolitics in the clinic, a sense that there are all of these different approaches to pain care that we, the expert has to embrace. Uh, one of the architects of a new approach, the uh, patient-controlled analgesia, is Philip Zexer in New York. And um, he says, well, how can we make this into the basis of a new science? He said, well, one of the things you can do is you can, you can use the patient as a controlled study. That is, you can have what the patient on one day administer standard analgesia, but maybe on another day give them a placebo. On another day give them a new analgesic drug, and then you actually use how they treat themselves as the basis of having a new theory of pain relief, like efficacy, et cetera. And he also points out something that's interesting to historians of science, which is the idea of multiple discoveries in different places. It turns out that four different researchers came up with this idea of patient-controlled analgesia in Leeds in the UK, in London, Ontario, in New York, and also in Palo Alto. Uh, just to, before I conclude, let me just say that it's this era of liberalization and pain theory that begins to run up against that lingering anxiety about malingering uh, and whether we were creating a system that was too indulgent. It had never really disappeared, and it reemerges in the 1970s with a new theory guiding it, the theory of learned pain. You see it in a 1972 news report uh, at NBC, which is written about the next day. It's a profile of a multidisciplinary pain clinic. It says, look, you know, there are people in bur with burns who were treated effectively here, but there's also a segment on what they call low back losers, whose learned low back pain costs the state of California $102 million a year in compensation. 
Uh, and then there's also the uh, acupuncture uh, segment as well. And it's this new theory of uh, learned pain that emerges and becomes more important in social policy as the 1970s unfold into the 1980s. The irony for me is that you know, a theory that started with um, electrical recording in cats uh, that led to the liberalization of pain medicine under the guise of gate control is now confronted with a new theory of pain that has its basis in the study of dogs. <laughs> it's, it's the brainchild of a University of Pennsylvania psychologist named Martin Seligman who writes about this theory of learned helplessness in 1965, and it's based on a study, uh, a Pavlovian study of dogs, where the dogs are subjected to painful stimuli, but restrained and unable to escape the stimuli. They grow accustomed to enduring that pain, and then when they are unrestrained and offered the opportunity to escape, they perceive a lack of control, and they exhibit helpless behavior, thus learned helplessness. Now, the interesting thing is this theory does not take off in the 1960s, given what I've described about the culture of the liberalization of pain theory in the 60s. But it's really in the 1970s and 80s that you start to see its broader application in social policy. By the 1980s, you might say, uh, social policy uh, advocates, well, those who are, do social policy are looking back and saying, over the last 20 years, as uh, Zeiser writes, a significant number of federal cases of disability were decided in which the alleged disability was wholly or substantially related to pain. So there's a way in which the system has grown to accommodate pain as a compensable disability. And you have a society now that is confronting the consequences of this vision of care and this ideology of care, liberal trends, relief in the name of compassion, social justice, individuality, the the, the uh, acknowledgement that subjective pain is real pain and intersubjective understanding now confronting new conservative impulses, uh, the social consequences of indulgence, the feeding of addiction, the creation of dependence, not just drug dependence, but social dependency, malingering, learned helplessness, and not to mention the economic and social costs of building this liberal commitment. And you see this also in the courts where it's the judges who have to decide what is pain and what degree of relief. So whereas the Page v. Zalabrisi case becomes one reference point for pain in the courts in 1963, by 1975 you see new rulings that say things like this. Pain is not easily diagnosed, but the secretary is not at the mercy of every claimant's subjective assertions of pain when determining eligibility for disability. And you also see how this theory of learned helplessness by a pain specialist in Atlanta is made to speak to the broadest questions in the political debate of the 1970s and 1980s, the debate between liberals and conservatives. He writes in a book on pain, chronic pain is often a conditioned socioeconomic disease. Majority of patients show pain behavior in excess of biomedical finding. Society has gone too far in granting monetary compensation for escape from work via pain complaints in a book entitled Chronic Pain, 1978. This theory of pain really manifests itself in social policy. Uh, so I, did the, I looked at the Bonica, Bonica papers, uh, I looked at, uh, and then I went to the Reagan archives uh, in order to do this project. And about a month or two after Reagan comes into office, it should not surprise any of us that one of the questions before the Reagan administration who argued that Government wasn't the solution to our problem. Government was the problem. That government programs had fed dependency, the growth of welfare. This liberal commitment needed to be scaled back. And when you go into the Office of Policy Development papers, the memo uh, written by P uh, Peter Farrar really puts this on stage and puts the measurement of pain front and center in the Reagan revolution. He writes, over the years, the disability benefit provision was significantly over-liberalized as compared with the original concept of paying such benefits only for truly permanent and total disability. Their proposal would change back the definition of disability so it would rest solely on medical grounds and would not take into account vague factors which are so difficult to determine in a consistent manner. Many pointed to the same story, disability benefits had ballooned uh, multifold. The growth was par particularly rapid, one observer says, after the rules were broadened to include mental disabilities, addictions, and subjective states like intense back pain. 
Reagan's was attempt to kind of roll back this commitment. Uh, and what followed was what most called the purging of the roles. Al almost 500,000 people were removed from the disability roles, many of whom were claiming subjective ailments as the reasons for the disability. Ironically, this resulted in lawsuits. It threw the question of pain determination even more into the courts than it had been before. And it became important for courts to judge those issues. As an IOM study in 1978 pointed out, the purging of the roles was followed by years of appeal and litigation, and after which more than half who appealed had their benefits restored. And much of the question had to do with how do you judge objective evidence and subjective complaints? And what is the role of HEW or HHS at this point in evaluating disability using these criteria? And so in a settlement that's emerged, in another landmark 1984 settlement, another uh, Minnesota Hennepin County housewife, Lorraine Pulaski, brings suit against the federal government for ending her disability benefits. It results in a victory for patients. And here you see the courts threading the line, not just between objectivity and subjectivity, but you might say also between how to balance the liberal commitments of the 60s and 1970s with these new conservative impulses. And it's all around the question of how you measure pain. While the claimant has the burden of proving that the disability results from a medically determined physical or mental impairment, direct medical evidence of the cause and effect relationship between the impairment and the degree of claimant's subjective complaints need not be produced. The adjudicator may not disregard a claimant's subjective complaints solely because the objective medical evidence does not fully support them. So all of this, this intricate discussion, is at the level of courts trying to figure out when does pain, when is it real, and when is it compensable. Uh, let me just wrap up by saying uh, I could take the story forward, and I will in one moment just to give you a sense of where it goes from there. But if you want to understand, therefore, why pain theory and why the politics of pain is, why pain is so controversial politically, I think I've just tried to illustrate some of those micropolitics at the bedside, uh, which means that the question of measurement, subjective, objective, were never really just questions of evidence. They were always questions of ideology, right? The question of what, what kind of commitment a liberal society should have to people in pain was always there when we ask the question, does subjective pain matter as real pain? It mattered for John Brown, it mattered in Pulaski case, and it matters still today. Uh, I also want to say that you know, pain theories also cross boundaries between science, medicine, and I hope we can illustrate how it comes into politics and law even more, um, and how these theories are put to use in not just kind of shaping the battles between liberals and conservatives. What I argue in the book, and I think it's actually a pretty solid argument, which is that the question of who's in pain and what level of relief they deserve becomes actually a central dividing point between what it means to be liberal and what it means to be conservative, what kind of commitments you have to people in pain. It ends up being a kind of a partisan divide. And, and in some ways, it kind of, you know, John Bonica's life kind of follows that trend. And when John Bonica uh, dies in 1994, it's an interesting year because a new politics of pain begins. And it's the politics of pain that I referred to at the beginning, the politics of end-of-life care, which has always been there. Uh, a new set of rights emerged in uh, 1994. Oregon passes its Death with Dignity Act. Uh, and, and there's a strong our activist push to define a right to die, uh, a right to compassionate relief. And where is that line between compassionate care and physicians? Is it suicide and euthanasia? In that context, states start to write uh, pain laws, regulations, and guidelines to help physicians understand what where they can, you know, how to do pain management in a way that keeps them legally safe. Uh, where what are the limits of compassionate care? And as that case emerges before the courts, you know, once again in the 1997 ruling in Glucksburg v. Virginia, uh, Glucksburg v. Washington. It is the Supreme Court that has to decide on where that line is. The AMA files a amicus brief in which they say what should guide the court is the concept of the principle of double effect. It's an old kind of medieval concept, you know, from Thomas Aquinas, Catholic theologian, that says, you know, that essentially what they're saying is 
when you use pain medicine in such a way that it re re reduces respiration and blood pressure and hastens death, this is entirely consistent with the goals of being a compassionate caregiver at the end of life. And it's that concept that Sandra Day O'Connor, as the quintessential swing judge in a court that's defined by liberal and conservative appointees and impulses, that essentially she anoints that idea uh, in validating not your right to die, but your right to palliation, your right to have to be relieved. And she says, if any state impedes that, the court reserves the right to come back again. Now, of course, she's no longer on the court. And so we don't know what a new court would say about these kinds of rulings. But at precisely the same time that the Reagan administration has been buffeted by these accusations of being heartless and unconcerned for people in pain, uh, they discover a pain that the moral majority, the religious conservatives, the rise of the religious right could love. And it's fetal pain. It's the idea that there are people in pain that religious conservatives care about. And this takes us back to the question of whose pain matters. In the 1980s and 1990s, you might say there's this partisan divide. Some people think that pain before the end, the before start of life is the pain we should be making laws about. And other people think that pain at the end of life are laws that we should be making, uh, or topics we should be making laws about. So there's this kind of new politics of pain that sets in motion. I won't really talk about it, except to uh, hear about I'm happy to chat about it. But ultimately, I think the thing I try to do in this book is to talk about how these visions of care, to use the theme of the conference, are really ideologies of care and ideologies of relief. Uh, and that persistent through this history is the question of who should judge who's in pain and how much relief they deserve, whose pain matters over the course of this history. It changes dramatically from soldiers to the elderly, uh, to people at the end of life, to the fetus. Science plays a role in that debate. And I also want to say that uh, insofar as there's a global lesson, it's that you know, these discourses kind of cross, cross global ground boundaries in various ways. Um, so John Bonica, what I like to do is to say that you know, I, take, I follow projects where they take me. And in that, I'm inspired by people like uh, John Bonica. And I hope that for those of you who are interested in trends in global health, you look not at the peculiarities of the US context, but how these kinds of politics of care and pain might play out on the global stage as well uh, as here in the US. So let me stop there. <laughs> Thank you for your beautiful lectures. It's the second time that we are taking part of the same section. We are going to start a kind of rock and roll group next time. <laughs> That's right. But the only difference is that my mother is Jewish <laughs> and Italian. <laughs> so I know I'm not an specialist, but I'm a kind of a specialist, you know, an internal specialist. Uh, okay, I understand that this time my work is easier here. I'm just go going to start asking some questions and then ask the other to, to follow me in here with better questions. I, I read your book, this is a time for merchandise. <laughs> it's a beautiful book, Pain and uh, Political History. I just want to st start with the way you start, using a quotation coming from Clinton, President Clinton. Uh, in the 1992 campaign, when he said, I feel your pain. It's very interesting the way we, you deal with this, because you started a whole debate between, as you were mentioned, liberal and conservative, and using the response of Schlesinger. How do you have to say Boris Schlesinger, yeah. Schlesinger. That, said, that said, I'm not here to deal with feelings. I feel, I feel your pain is bullshit. No? <laughs> Pain is a central word in our world. And then I, I thought it would be, as you mentioned, this is a book about North America, and that's not a problem. But then I went to the speeches of our presidents. For example, President Lula. President Lula, in his first speech, he said, said, our pain in Brazil is big, but I hope that our power and strength it will be bigger than Brazil. Later on, in 209, Lula came back with this kind of subject in a, a more direct way. 
He said, I want to ask doctors, public employees, and nurses, or those that are here with angry against our mayor, or perhaps blaming me as a president, and he wrote, for God's sake, uh, uh, do not abandon people that come to you. Meet the people with a smile in the face, uh, with a, in a polite way, and if your neighbor can be dying with a kidney stone, that is for me, he said, the worst pain in the world, but one can have a stomach ache, a kidney ache, or a finger ache, or a head ache, and even he said, Sometimes you have a pain because you drank a lot of sugar cane, pinga. <laughs> but the, the most important thing is that each one makes bigger his or her pain. And the doctor is the one that knows all the pains and those who need care and knows everything about those who need care. I just use those. Uh, speeches coming from President Lula, uh, um, uh, and try to put together with one thing that you came up, up in your conclusion. Pain can, has nothing to do with thirst, but rather with drama. I immediately thought about, as a politician, uh, as an anthropologist, uh, drama in the sense of Victor Turner. Drama in the sense of a model that reflects but creates, is a product but produces. Uh, so, questions. First thing, in your book you show how politicians, scientists, physicians and, uh, are very important actors in this kind of theater, as you put, put it here, theater of uh, compassion. How do, could you describe your position as an historian in this drama, in mm -hmm. a drama that has a lot of circularity and a drama that has a lot of ref ref reflexibility. Second question, and then I'm going on. Uh, reading your, your book, one can see a very chronological and really an historical pro process of one side, controlling pain, pain in the other side, taking part of the theater. I live in, in a country, and the doctors that are here can say that I'm completely wrong, that people like to mix everything. So you go to a doctor, but you also go to a popular doctor, an Afro-Brazilian doctor, an indigenous doctor. You also go for natural medicaments. So pain, in your opinion, yes, it's very clear. It's a question of ideology. But as someone asked before, Pain is also a kind of desire for miracles. I'm using Mark Bloch idea of the mir miracles can produce a lot. To end, uh, I remember a quotation coming from Le Lewis Carroll from Alice in the Wonder World. And I, I think you remember that Alice had a big problem trying to enter in, the never, in, the, in this new world. And then uh, I, the, the it was Humpty Dumpty that said, you have to drink it. <laughs> and he, he gave her two bottles. But in the two bottles, it was reading the same sentence, drink me. And then Eddie said, how can I know which one I have, I have to drink? Because what I know, what she knew, is that if he, she would drink one, she will be bigger. And will never enter in the new world. If she will drink the black one, she will be smaller and enter. And the, the answer was, those who believe in formulas are always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so let us talk a little, as an anthropologist, about this idea of believing and miracles, and how we could uh, write this story, that is a beautiful story, but another story that could be not <laughs> very like chronological, but mm -hmm. a story that would mix temporalities and mix different kinds of explanations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. <clears throat> well, uh, you're asking two questions that are really wonderful, but they're, they're taking me back to my uh, disciplinary roots. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of it has to do with 
explaining what one's commitment to history is. <clears throat> and the way I would put it is that that um, my commitment as a scholar is to trying to show that the kinds of the kinds of kinds of debates that we have today, which are too easily read through the lens of whatever the current fascinations might be. Um, if you remember when Ronald Melzack said, just because we live in a time when surgery, drugs, and pharmacology are in the ascendant, that doesn't mean that's what pain is. Yeah. For me, what a historian does is that by moving back in time, starting in a different place, and then figuring out how we have come to be having this debate, it allows me to gain some kind of critical perspective on the present. Mm -hmm. So my commitment to history is also a commitment to, <clears throat> to showing that in the past, things that appear to be profoundly illogical, even abhorrent, like the lobotomy as a way of treating pain, in their era made sense. And for me, that's a way of destabilizing a clinical self-confidence uh, that they know what pain is and have always known what the topic is and have a unique authoritative perspective on the problem. So my commitment to history starts with going in much the same way that anthropologists go into foreign territory and try to understand the the logic of what appears to be illogical interactions. My commitment to temporality is to ask the question, how does that change? And what changes that? What changes surgical self-confidence? What changes, and, and how those changes sometimes stem from developments that have nothing at all to do with the claims that are made in any given time period. So to be committed to a history perspective is to be committed to the idea that the process of explaining where we are today is something that requires like effort and it requires attention to the nuances of and the vagaries of how how things change uh, which is to say which is why I um, I, I tend not I, I tend to be committed to temporality and committed to understanding a different time period as a, as a lens, and then to show the fact that what we, because by doing that, I think what I think a historian can do is to show that our debates today, for instance, the debates about heroin and Oxycontin, not only have we been there before, right, and so there's a kind of a critique of forgetting, and there's a critique of, uh, of the, the, the A of the ahistorical, that is to say, when you don't know history, it's that you don't actually have any clue why we're even having this discussion in the first place, mm -hmm. right? So, so um, that's the kind of stat strategy I've taken as a historian. Um, so the, the, the question then, your, your second, I mean, I could sort of talk a, a little bit more about history. I mean, I could, you could keep, I could keep talking in, about what it means to have a historical commitment that's married to a kind of a sociological impulse as well, which is mm -hmm. what I also am yeah. trained in and committed to the sociology of knowledge. Um, when it comes to kind of, you know, the desire for miracles and the mixing, what I would say is that, you know, considered in the aggregate, when you grapple with a question of pain over a long period of time, you see the inevitability of mixing, of drawing on multiple ways of thinking. Uh, so in my previous, one of my previous books, yeah. Dying in the City of the Blues, yeah. Uh, which is about a pain experience in African Americans that's set in Memphis, inevitably you have to understand blues as a genre, uh, cultural expression of pain, and how that manifested itself and to some extent uh, came into conflict with and maybe did a better job of characterizing pain than any clinical science could. So that's the other commitment that I have in doing history, which is to reach back in time, but also to find the kinds of conversations about what pain is that may not embrace miracles, per se, 
but also show the problem of thinking too formulaically. I mean, I think that the, the problem in medicine today or the problem in the academy is to apply formulas too rigidly to try to understand social and me medical phenomena or health phenomena. And for me, a historical perspective allows me to, to play with these ideas about how we know what we know, how we've come to know what we know, and, um, and even if it means embracing um, you know, questions of uh, religion or um, drama or blues music, et cetera. So I hope that kind of gets us going in a sense of, you know, that, that's, what, that's what being a historian, what a historian means to me. <laughs> Uh, just very briefly, I would say that you know one of the th challenges I take up in the book is the question of of how does pain theory articulated even at the level of national government, like Lula's com comment, Clinton's comment, how does it, if at all, translate into policy? I mean, that's that's the question that I take, and and so it's not to say that I'm always interested in whenever any politician says something about pain, it's that do they see the question of pain as drawing attention to a particular group of citizens, a particular kind of experience that's worthy of intervention and relief, right? And so that's the thing that captures me, uh, captures my interest. So one of the questions I would ask about Brazil is when Lula makes this comment, what is the, what are the, what are the, policies that he is then promoting that makes good on this 
commitment so that he can attach a particular legislation or a particular set of legislative, or is it just a kind of a generalized comment that you know I feel your, all of your pain? Um, the 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 critique. Now, the, uh, I'll take them in a couple of orders, but the, the liberal conservative thing, even though I play it up here, one of the things that I do in the book and I'm committed to is the idea that the lines between where liberal and conservative commitments cross are actually very fuzzy. So it's Jimmy Carter, the liberal that Reagan attacks, who actually starts the continuum review process for, for people on disability. What, 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 what Reagan does is he he built he bought, he grows that in scale, and he and then he 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 criticizes liberals as having a flawed set of sense of judgment about who's in pain and being misguided. And in some ways, it's it's a high point in the in the in the emergence of a partisan divide. But I would say up until then, it, the partisan divide isn't as clear. So there's a way in which the political rhetoric reinforces the idea that there's something called a liberal pain commitment and a conservative one. Um, the, the, I'll come back to this kind of liberal conservative question in a second. Um, the, you know, this question of uh, productivity is, is really interesting. So when Judge Brown in 1963 validates uh, pain as real, subjective pain as real pain, he is actually, he refers to a 1937 court ruling by a judge named uh, Learned Hand, uh, a very important and influential judge in American uh, ju judicial history, who had previously ruled on the question of disa disability and disability benefits. And he wrote, I quote, some of the best work of life is done under circumstances of disability. And for, through the 1930s into the 40s and 50s, this was a, an important reference point in uh, disability policy and in ideas about pain, which is just being in pain or being disabled doesn't, doesn't qualify you for any benefits. In fact, that could be actually very productive. A lot of the criticisms of new disability policy is about the fact that it's overturning this commitment to, heart, to work under any circumstances. Uh, and in some ways, when Reagan comes into office, it's that model of productivity getting people back to work that is important. Now, the drug companies, what's fascinating is that in the history of, and this is, in, they're able to play both sides of this. So they can both play the, drugs are important because they get people back to work, right? The question is when addiction feeds dependency, then people can't work and become social problems. So how do you find the substance that allows us to get people back to work, to be productive and able-bodied, but not to become social problems. Um, the market, they argue, is good. So the neoliberal, the conservatives, uh, that is the neoliberal model, says this is where you need the market to do the work of providing relief. But in an atmosphere where there are also people who don't have access to relief because of poverty, the pharmaceutical industry says, we also believe that undertreatment is a problem. And so they also support the goal of people who have not gotten relief, who are underrepresented minorities, African American, in urban settings, because they believe that pain reform also be, needs to be relieved in, in ways that liberals could see as valuable, which is bringing relief to people who don't have access to it. So there's a way in which the pharmaceuticalization story can satisfy many different political needs. It's not just uh, kind of a market friendly, it's also doing the important work of social reform. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I hope that kind of addresses some of the questions that you raised, maybe not all of them, so I'm happy to come back again. <coughs> Let's go make a, a, a one more round. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add something, but and Thank you for talking, it's amazing. And uh, I have a lot of questions, but uh, what I'm going to ask you is that I've been doing a research in South Africa, and uh, I spent here a year as a visiting researcher. And uh, what I saw there in South Africa, but also here, was a very tight relation between pain, 
resentment and race. Uh -huh. Can you talk about it? How the way you see it? Or if it doesn't make sense? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> yeah, a, a couple of things. First of all, I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I just want to just congratulate you, not just on the substance, but also that you took your book and you made it a lively talk. That's a really hard thing to do, but I just really, just really appreciated that. Um, okay, so, so here's a few things. Um, I now live in California, so I'm now one of those crazy people in California. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I recognize that. No, but I actually am, because this is what I realized, where I wasn't on all the many thousands of years I lived on these coasts. And so what I realized is, is that I now have a topical ointment for pain that's marijuana. Yeah. Because I live in California, okay? And it's absolutely 100,000% accepted, where I am, in fact, it was people I work with, other faculty who proposed that this is something that I should use, and I got immediate relief. Uh -huh. And what I'm struck with is the fact that now there's a sense of almost shame on the East Coast about actually being able to talk about using this pain medication, which is topical. And yet, and I, and I thought, there's something really interesting about just perceptions around stigma, mm -hmm. and I kind of wanted to put that kind of on, on the table. That's that great. I took non-personal questions. <laughs> right, right. I just wanted to kind of throw that out. Um, one is about his, the historical use of quantitative data. Mm -hmm. And I wondered in terms of quantifying pain at a state level, when we were talking about this, and if that's something that we could think about some, since we're thinking about state level action and how we could quantify this. And I'm really struck finally with this link between the pain discussion we're having and the care discussion we were having before. And I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about those links. Uh, um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is a, uh, I'd like to talk about a little bit more about uh, the pain medication assess uh, in development countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil, we we have like problems to uh, morphine or something in the uh, primary care, and I would like to talk if you talk about more in a political way. And uh, I'm also uh, thinking about what that she said about the relationship between what you said and and the care, and I would bring to table the the taboo of pain, uh, because I also have chronic pain, and uh, it's a little bit difficult to, to talk about it, or uh, like in social ways, and, and you know, I like to bring that up as well. Yeah, I'd like to add one question. Uh, I thought about temporality and uh, the role of the historian, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd like to, to challenge this, your perception in the present <laughs> around, uh, how do you feel the the, the, in the present days, uh, the political uh, forces and subjects, in terms of who is or who are the the main gate, uh, gatekeepers of defining what is pain, and if, and if doctors, medical doctors, are still in this, in this place, and if it would be important to take them out of this place, <laughs> yeah. Okay. These are great questions. Um, uh, so, th there was an earlier question about American exceptionalism that actually is part of the question about um, the developing world as well. Um, and the one of the things I would say is that um, is that one of the things that makes the American story exceptional is the robust, you might say, um, administrative infrastructures yeah. that exist to manage access and create these debates and then adjudicate these debates over who has access to what, whether you're talking about pharmacies, administrative law, social security disability, court systems at one level or another. So it, it, this is what makes America kind of, you know, not exceptional, but a particular characteristic of it. The other is that, um, you know, there is a kind of a moral particular, a particular kind of moral debate, but I think you could, you'll find it everywhere about what pain is. And the thing that is also particular to the U.S. is this kind of like aggressive 
consumer-oriented culture. Uh, I think the U.S. and between U.S. and Canada, I believe, you can we consume something like 80 plus percent of the world's oxycodone supply, which is not to say that there's 80 percent of the pain yeah. in the U.S., but it's 80 percent of the consumption, <coughs> right? And how that's connected with questions of uh, you know back pain. Uh, and how that's connected with consumerism is another, is a problem, is a question. Um, the, the place where race and resentment uh, shows up, for me, I didn't talk about it today, but it's partly, it's in the book, is the, um, there, there's a puzzle that emerges in the 1990s, and it was in my previous book, which is, and the puzzle in the 1990s is the discovery that in Los Angeles uh, for Latinos, in lo with long bone fractures, when you do a study comparing the admin administration of pain medicines, what you find is um, that people, Af Latinos in LA or African Americans in Atlanta are less likely to be medicated for long bone fractures, very painful condition. Uh, and what these studies do by Knox Todd is to show that it's not at the level of assessment. In other words, you can actually show that the pain is being assessed in whites and Latinos or whites and blacks at the same level. It's the level of administration. And so what he asks is, he, does, he can't answer the question, but he asks, is it that um, people, that practitioners assess pain similarly, but choose to administer pain to pain differently? Is it because uh, patients want less pain medicine across these different spectrums? Uh, and, and what he tries to do is to break apart the problem of uh, how you read pain, uh, pain need across different groups. And all of these are inflected with questions of race and difference in, in much the same way that Zabrowski's work. Um, the, the other thing that's particular about the US, and this relates to the differences between California and New York, is that, um, is that we're a kind of a, f a federal setup. So, so we have a tension right now between what the federal government says uh, is valid and useful for pain medicine, the, so that marijuana, LSD, and heroin are Schedule I substances according to the, uh, the Controlled Substances Act, where they have no valid medical uses. But at the same time, you have states that have passed medical marijuana laws or legalized marijuana. So you have this tension that is in law. And it's a question of jurisdiction. At any moment, the Department of Justice could shut down everything that you're talking about. And with a change of administration, you could well see that, an effort to close everything that has opened up in Colorado, in Washington State, or in California. It's a question of enforcement. It's not a question of the law. Now, in the course of debating physician-assisted suicide, on, in the Bush administration, John Ashcroft, as, uh, as Attorney General, tried to say, under the Controlled Substances Act, I am going to rule that any use of barbiturates or any substances to hasten death in Oregon is, is, is illegal. This had to be decided by the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that this was an, an over-reading of the jurisdiction of the Controlled Substances Act, that it was not intended to interfere with medical practice. It was intended to interfere with the use of a number of other substances. So, so what you have is this active debate, which you see playing out in the Supreme Court, as to whose, juris whose laws matter and whose jurisdiction is most relevant. And that's something that's particular to the United States. That is to say, it's not peculiar to the United States, but it's a particular feature of how the, we, we have state laws and then we have federal laws. And it's up to the courts to decide whose laws matter. Uh, and I suspect that in the rest of my lifetime, I will see this debate about uh, medical marijuana, about the ointment that you're using play out in courts yet again. Um, on the quantitative data uh, and how this connects with kind of pain and care, I mean, I try to kind of suggest that you know, my concern has been less with the uh, visions of care, but ideologies of care, and like the investment, the, the, but I can't say, I didn't attend a whole lot of the early morning sessions, so I can't really speak in a really robust way of how it connects back, other than to kind of signal that pain is a particularly fraught area for thinking about um, pain. Um, the, the, to thinking, thinking about care. 
Um, there is the question of the taboo, right, of uh, chronic pain. And I, I think that, you know, in uh, the way I would put it really bluntly is that um, chronic pain is a vexing and frustrating problem for those who are in charge of gatekeeping and who are in charge of managing um, managing access to relief, whatever that is. And that's because they have inherited a, a kind of an acute care model of what healthcare should be. And we have a society, especially our this society, that is still not sure how to deal with the chronic, that which is chronic, that which is, but we have a society where, so I'll give you an example, like when I was, I used to teach in the medical school at Chap in North Carolina, and I tried to introduce students to the idea, first year and second year medical students, the idea that, um, you know, what has, how has diabetes changed over the course of the 20th century? And this gets you back to the, what you can learn from history. And I say, well, you know, one of the things about diabetes is that we have really successfully intervened in such a way that by inventing and producing insulin, by uh, having kidney dialysis for late stage sequelae of diabetes, we have actually managed over the course of a century to transform diabetes from an acute illness into a chronic illness. So we haven't cured diabetes. Diabetes is still with us. In fact, there's more diabetes than there ever was before. And we've created new laws like the end stage renal disease law that says if your kidneys fail on diabetes, you have access to dialysis paid for by government. It's an entitlement, right? So, so we've created this kind of robust infrastructure and medical science has helped to transform this acute disease into a chronic illness. When I told that story to medical students, I kid you not, and they were assigned a reading on it, they found it depressing. <laughs> they found it um, frustrating. And, they used, and they, it, for them, it questioned why they were even in medicine. Yeah. And I said, you've got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> this, is, this is what diabetes is. And, and they had come into the medical school with an idea that was completely un, uh, you know, unread, not ready to deal with clinical realities, which is your patients will come back to you again. You're not there to cure diseases. Yes, there are cures, but most of what you will be doing is managing you know, people with illness, and they will come back again. And you have to grow comfortable with this idea. And, and I have to tell you, it was a fight with these students. To, this is very early medical students. It was a fight. So then when they get into the clinics, they go, oh, this is what it's really like. But they don't have any kind of framework for understanding what it means to enter medicine from the outset. That is, they say these are the issues that are at the core of being a doctor or being a healthcare practitioner. So I guess what I'd say is when you have that mindset that's still there, that's reinforced everywhere in our culture that for every problem there's a treatment, for every illness there's a cure, then it's not surprising that issues that are chronic, that come back again, foster this kind of, um, this kind of uh, dissatisfaction and uh, frustration. And, and what I argue is that, and this is kind of pushing the boundaries of what I'm, I, I do say in a little bit in the book, which is that physicians by and large they take their frustrations and they read it onto the patients. So that, that idea about a maladjusted personality being the basis of the chronic pain complaint, what I say in the early stages of the book is that you, can, you can't help but use a, psych, a, a, psycho, a, a psychiatric lens to talk about issues of displacement, the way in which their frustration is displaced and their frustrations are displaced and they problematize the pain complainant as a personality that is fundamentally corrupt because they themselves don't know how to deal with this problem. You know? And so that's my, my, end, my, the, my end point is to turn attention to the judges and to ask why is it that they take their frustrations and they characterize patients in the way that they do as an outlet as a way of kind of communicating about their frustrations. It's really not about the people in pain, it's about themselves. And the last thing I'd say um, is, you know, who are the gatekeepers? Well, you know, what's funny is it changes over the course of my history. And there's an actually, there's a fascinating moment when physicians themselves 
Um, people like uh, Jack Kravorkian, right, who is trying to push physician-assisted suicide, or John Kitzhaber, who is the governor in California, uh, in Oregon, uh, or even people like uh, Stratton Hill. In, there, there are moments when physicians decide to get into politics and to push the boundaries of relief, not, not so much Kevorkian, in order to kind of try to make change happen at the legal level because they are, their sense of frustration, not with patients, but with the healthcare system has grown up. So that's a good example of how the gatekeepers themselves realize that you know, keeping access to relief as a doctor is not going to solve the fundamental problems of society, and they move into politics. So you know, I, I feel like what you do in history is you're able to open up these moments when things change, and you're able to sort of look at particular lives. And um, you know, at the point when John Bonica confronts acupuncture, he has built the pain field, but then he's concerned about policing its boundaries. And you can see him move into gatekeeper mode where he says, you know, acupuncture is not getting in here, right? And I'm not going to let acupuncture, I'm going to try to be concerned about acupuncture's development because now I see it as a, a problem for the pain practitioner. So anyway, I think I've talked enough there. <laughs> Thank you.